Hello YouTube, so Nassim Taleb recently released an article attacking IQ research and I thought I would do a response to it. So a lot of this has to do with IQ's predictive relationship with various measures of success as you can see in this chart. IQ is related to tons of measures of success uh, in a pretty significant way and this has been confirmed by hundreds, probably thousands of studies. Uh, each row here represents a different meta-analysis on the relationship between IQ and some success outcome. And this is why people think that IQ is important because it can help us predict things we want to predict and explain things we want to explain. Now, Taleb is worried that the relationship between IQ and these success outcomes is insufficiently linear. So we can see in this chart here, plotting the relationship between IQ and SAT, that as you go up the SAT or IQ distribution, the relationship becomes less positive. But we can also see that even at the top of the relationship, far above average, the relationship is still positive. Now we can see similar things here from a study of over a million people, uh, men in, from Denmark, showing that after an IQ of about 115, there really isn't a lot of change in certain outcomes for IQ, but the same study shows a perfectly linear relationship between income and IQ. And amusingly, I like this chart. We see similar thing between motor uh, vehicle fatalities and IQ in the United States. It's basically just people with below average IQs that have an elevated risk for getting in an accident. It's also a big, I mean, look at that, three times the death rate for people with IQs in the uh, mid 80s. Now, this is the sort of thing you can find examples of this, but this is not actually the norm. So there have been studies analyzing, like for instance, Coward and Sackett in 1990 looked at 174 studies on the relationship between IQ and job performance. A linear trend fit the data better than a nonlinear trend in almost all cases. The same thing is found in uh, this 2011 study looking at relationship between IQ and education and military success outcomes. So that in large analyses of huge numbers of cases, what we see is that, yeah, nonlinear trends fit better sometimes, but that is the exception, not the rule. In that study of 174 studies in the relationship between IQ and job performance, nonlinear trends fit better 5 to 6% of the time. So normally IQ's relationship with success is best plotted by a linear function, at least when we're talking about occupational and educational outcomes. Uh, and in any case, Taleb never explains why it would be a problem if this wasn't true. He just says it. Now, with respect to job performance, Taleb says that he doesn't see the point in giving people IQ tests. He says if you want to detect how someone fares at a task, uh, we don't need theoretical exams by probability challenge psychologists. Just have him or her do that task. So this is basically just a work sample test is what he's talking about. Have someone do a sample of the work they're going to do. Uh, this is silly. Uh, IQ has predictive validity that is independent of a work sample test, meaning that if you have already administered someone a work sample test and you're trying to predict how well they perform at the job, your ability to do so will increase even further if you give them an IQ test. And in fact, IQ tests have a higher, on average, level of predictive validity than do work sample tests, meaning that if you had to choose between one or the other, you would choose IQ. Uh, the, these are, the fact that IQ has incremental validity over work sample tests is a very well-known fact in the basic literature. So Taleb's complaints are not compelling here. Now, he also talks about normal distributions. He says that, oh my gosh, uh, real-world stuff is not normally distributed. IQ tests are, but that's a trick because they were designed that way. It's an artifact of test construction, which is true. And that since the real-world stuff like job performance and, and outcomes, presumably, are not normally distributed well, he says that the covariance between IQ and performance, uh, the covariance between these things either doesn't exist or it is entirely uninformational. So, yeah, lots of things aren't normally distributed. Yeah, IQ scores are normally distributed because of the test design. And yes, most statistical methods, at least parametric ones, do assume uh, that things are normally distributed, so this can be a problem. But the conclusion that IQ's covariance with these things is uh, basically meaningless, entirely uninformational, that's silly. I mean, first of all, there's no distinction here made between research on outcomes that are normally distributed and the ones that aren't. That seems a little strange. Secondly, just because something's not normally distributed doesn't mean that the statistical analysis is ruined, right? It has to be a large enough departure from normality to cause a serious problem, and there's no attempt by Taleb to analyze how common that occurs. And then when it does occur, there, there are things researchers do, right? Like most typically, they just plug the variable through a log transformation in order to achieve a successful level of normality. Uh, there's no reason that he gives anyway, and there are critics of the log transformation approach, but he doesn't give any argument against it or for the idea that, that people aren't doing this as much as they should or something. I mean, for Talab's uh, criticism to be compelling, he would need to cite specific studies in which normality was departed from in a way that rendered the statistical analysis invalid, and then show that this study was important in the literature, that removal of studies like this that all have this flaw changes an important conclusion of the IQ literature. Of course, that would be a very difficult thing to do. It would require effort, uh, and Talab doesn't do that.
and besides this whole idea that IQs covariance with outcomes is just the result of a statistical fluke, that it's literally meaningless. I mean, that's just obviously silly because the correlations manifest in a way that is theoretically sensible, right? So that IQ correlates with job performance positively, it correlates more positively in cognitively complex jobs, it correlates with education, it correlates between fraternal twins less strongly than identical twins, etc. Like, uh, the chance of this happening if the results were just meaningless is extremely low. And so the, the conclusion here that it's just uninformational, it just seems on its face wrong. Now, a major theme of the article is Taleb's uh, standards for measurement, which are his own, that so far as I know, no one else has. Uh, he writes that IQ is not even technically a measure because it explains at best between 13 and 50% of performance in some tasks, those that are similar to the test itself, minus the data misogyny and statistical statistical cherry-picking by psychologists. It doesn't satisfy the monotonicity and transitivity required to have a measure. No measure that fails 60 to 95% of the time should be part of, quote, science, end quote. So, I mean, let's just think about this. So, firstly, he says that a measurement must explain more than 50% of the variance and the thing it's being used to predict. So, so if we have a measure and the use of it reduces our degree of predictive error by 50%, we can't use it, or, or it's not, at least we can't call it a measure because Taleb says so. I mean, he doesn't give an argument to justify this. He just kind of says it. And it's a weird thing to say since it seems obviously not true because it's hard to even imagine a situation in which it would not be helpful to use something that reduces our error by 50%. Now, but also this demand for variables that explain a huge proportion of variance, this is just not appropriate for the study of human behavior because human behavior is complex. And what I mean by that is that it is explained by large numbers of variables of small to moderate effect. And because of that, if you have a correct model most of the variables are going to explain a relatively small amount of variance, at least if by small we just mean less than half, right? Taleb's demands here are just not appropriate for behavioral sciences, where we're studying things that, again, are the function of lots of things, each of which makes a small independent contribution to the variance and the outcome. And this is a theme we'll see later. For some reason, and I'm not really familiar with Taleb's work, but I know he's involved with probability somehow, and so it's weird to me that there's a recurring theme here of him thinking in a very monocausal way. And we'll see that, as I say, later. So he also says that, well, you can't have a measure that fails 60% or more of the time. And it's like, firstly, well, what the hell does fail mean in the case of IQ? That's not obvious. And where did you get the number from? That's like, that's not obvious either. It's just Taleb's number. I don't know. Uh, But but, but anyway, this is just a really silly thing to say, right? You can't use any science that fails 60% of the time. I mean, say your probability of correctly solving a problem is 1% without a given measure and 40% with said measure. Right? Thus, the measure increases your fact, your success by a factor of 40. But you can't use it because Taleb says it's not a, 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 a science? It's not a science. I mean, that seems very silly. And then maybe there's a compelling argument for this counterintuitive conclusion in Taleb's head, but he doesn't put it in the article. He just says this. Like, it's a thing. <laughs> but it's not. Now, in this monotonicity thing, this is this linear thing. This idea that, oh, the relationship has to be perfectly linear all the way up. And it normally is, as I've said, but why would it even need to be? Like, you just, you're trying to predict something. And if the relationship is nonlinear, you just find out it's nonlinear and then model it correctly. And then there you go. There's no obvious problem. And to be honest, even if you thought it was linear when it wasn't, it could still be useful, right? Because if it's linear for the vast majority of the distribution, then it will still be helpful probably in your predictive uh, activity. So if, if the relationship breaks down above IQs over 130, well, who the hell cares if you're looking at the general population? Like, no one has an IQ of over 130, right? So, and obviously I'm being uh, hyperbolic. Yes, we care. Yes, some people do. But it's rare enough that it's probably still going to be helpful to use. Uh, but, but again, the reality is you just test to see if a nonlinear model would fit better. And if it does, you just use that model. So I don't know why this is supposed to be this crushing thing and again maybe there's an argument for why this is super important but he doesn't give it i mean to my mind let's just use a practical standard not talib standard right like firms and colleges are trying to predict success in their respective institutions social scientists are trying to explain differences in interesting life outcomes and such iq helps us do these things so there you go like that fact legitimizes it now talib also he says a bunch of rude things about people who score highly on iq tests which is very strange uh he says that the people who score high on IQ tests are paper shuffling, obedient intellectuals, yet idiots who are uncomfortable with uncertainty and not answering questions, that they lack critical thinking skills. He says that IQ measures best the ability to be a good slave, and the people with high IQs are losers. It's all very silly. And, and uh, of course, this is entirely theoretical. He doesn't cite any empirical evidence, and he doesn't even say what sort of empirical constructs might be used to test his claim. But we can make some guesses. So, I mean, let's talk about conformity. 
Uh, Roads and Woods, 1992, conducted a meta-analysis, found that people scoring high on IQ tests are less likely than average to be convinced by conformity-driven uh, rhetoric. So, less conformist. People with high IQs also tend to be atheists and libertarians. Uh, I'm an atheist, but not a libertarian. So, I'm not just saying this because I like both these things. Uh, but th- these are minority viewpoints in both cases, right? So, it's not what you would expect if people were just conforming. Now, uh, let's also talk about risk-seeking behavior, right? Because... Talib stereotype that he's pushing would, would seem to imply that I, high IQ people don't like risk, but actually, if you look at the research, most research either finds no relationship between IQ and risk aversion or a negative relationship, such that high IQ people are more risk-seeking. That's the result. Uh, th- those are the results implied by this 2016 review. Also, 2017 study, a large sample, 11,000 twins, finds that uh, high IQ people are more risk-seeking, and specifically with respect to finance as well as in general. Uh, with, this, with this slave comment, like this weird, oh, high IQ people, slaves... Yeah, okay, well, IQ is positively correlated to the probability of someone being an entrepreneur. And moreover, Judge and Colbert, 2004, uh, Judge and Colbert, 2004, meta-analyzed 151 previous samples, positive relationship between IQ and effectiveness as a leader or probability of becoming a leader. So, uh, not slaves, evidently. Uh, for critical thinking, I mean, IQ is unsurprisingly correlated to formal tests of rationality that gauge people's propensity to engage in uh, mental heuristics when they shouldn't, to think in biased ways, to not understand probability, etc., and there's this narrative that, oh, it measures academic smarts, the IQ test, but not street smarts, and not situational smarts, not practical intelligence in real life. But actually, according to meta-analyses, there's about a 0.46 correlation between someone's IQ and how they score in tests of situational judgment. So, I mean, these are just false stereotypes about people with high IQs. And it's funny, in a way, how society has legitimized, or at least, I don't know if society really has, but the Taleb, anyway, can get away with talking massive shit about people who have high IQs, imagine if if people, you know, imagine if Charles Murray posted something equally negative about people who have low IQs, right? That would be taken very differently. So Talib also says four weird things about population differences in IQ. Uh, one again is like statistical. He says that all oh, these these racists. He he calls people racist and it. it's very silly. But he says all oh, these racists. They say black people are X standard deviations away, but different populations have different variances. Uh, he says these are severe, severe mathematical flaws, implying that you can't, I don't know, talk about the standardized difference between groups that they have different standard deviations. So yes, there are different variances. I mean, I don't know if Talib read this stuff. He would know it's been talked about for decades. The black people have a smaller standard deviation than white people do. You just aggregate them together and calculate a pooled standard deviation, though. This isn't novel or magic. And it, for, for any time you're talking about a standard deviation of a population, you can break that population down into subsets that have different standard deviations. All right, so this... There's no obvious reason why this is a problem, but again, this is just like the Taleb saying things show, asserting things show. That's what this article is. I mean, it could be a problem if for some reason someone used the aggregate standard deviation as if it was the standard deviation of black people. But to my knowledge, that doesn't happen, and Taleb doesn't provide any evidence that that happens. Normally, this is just used to express the fact that the difference between the groups is rather large, which it is regardless of which group standard deviation you use. There's no obvious problem here. Uh, and, And then he says... Oh, well, some people say, he says, quote, the argument that some races are better at running, hence some inference about the brain, is stale. He, he says that several times. He thinks arguments are the sorts of things that go stale, which is strange. And he says mental capacity is much more dimensional and not defined in the same way running 100 meter dashes. So this dimensional stuff is bizarre. He doesn't make any argument against the normal view, which is that the major- majority of variance in cognitive abilities accounted for by a single dimension, the G factor. First principal component extracted from the covariance of IQ subtests. I think he knows this is a thing, and so he knows that the field says he's wrong, and maybe he has an argument why the field is wrong, but he doesn't say it. So yeah, I'm just going to say the obvious thing, that actually mental capacity, insofar as we're talking about cognitive ability, well, it's hierarchical, but at the top it's one-dimensional. So put it that way. Uh, and this defining thing. Well, okay, well, firstly, let's talk about this this argument about races. I mean, we, we could more charitably say it, Right than than he does. So we could say that. So we could say that between ethnic groups, if we look at you know races, well there are genetically driven differences for basically any trait outside of the brain that differs between individuals. So any variable non-brain phenotype seems to differ between the races for genetic reasons, and this surely increases the prior probability of genetically driven differences for variable traits within the brain. I mean, after all, the distinction between brain and non-brain, while important to us, is not important for evolution, and the same processes that cause non-brain differences also can cause brain differences, you know, natural selection and the like. So, in the absence of other evidence, and maybe there is other evidence, 
But this argument might just say, in the absence of other evidence, the prior probability of neurologically variable traits differing between ethnic groups due to genetics is high. Now, whatever one may think of this argument, Taleb's response that we define mental traits differently than physical traits uh, is, let's say, non-mind changing. Right, because like, like this is just again, this is just like the Taleb saying thing show. Taleb doesn't explain firstly why the difference in how we define these things matters to the argument, and, and secondly how we even define these different in the first place. So he just merely asserts that there's some unspecified difference in definition, and implies that this difference is relevant to the argument in an unspecified way. So this is obviously not compelling. I, I don't know how it could be. Now, now Taleb also says he says if you looked at Northern Europe from ancient Babylon and Egypt and the like you would have written the inhabitants off. So in ancient times, we would have said these Europeans are not going anywhere, but then they went somewhere. So be careful when you discuss populations. And I mean, no one's going to disagree with the conclusion, be careful when you discuss populations, but it is still worth saying some things about the relationship between ancient national development and current national development and how that in turn relates to certain biological narratives about the drivers of long-term national development. So yeah, the, the people who were most developed back in the day are not the ones that are most developed today. But that doesn't mean you couldn't have predicted the ones that are going to become the most developed if you were around back then, and you could have, and we know you could have, and we know you could have because today we can look at estimates of what the ecology of places was like in prehistoric times in terms of things like the potential crop yields and the domestic domesticatability of the animals there, things like this, and on the basis of that, build a model, which, again, on the basis of these prehistoric variables, explains the majority of variation in national development today. So there is a relationship, a non-immediately obvious, but not that weird relationship between ancient development, not ancient development, but ancient ecology and current development. Now, how does this relate to the idea that long-run national differences are partially influenced by genes? That's complicated because these ecological differences, well, they could cause direct differences in development. They could cause indirect environmental differences by influencing institutions and culture. They could cause genetic differences by influencing selective pressures. And in fact, they could cause differences in selective pressures by changing the cultural institutions that themselves influence who's having kids, or can do all these things. There's nothing about the relationship between ancient and current variation and national development that implies that somehow genes obviously just weren't important. Now, finally, Taleb remarks that the same people hold that IQ is heritable that it determines success and that Asians have higher IQ than Caucasians, degrade Africans, then don't realize that China for about a century, had one order of magnitude lower GDP than the West. And it's like, dude, what are you talking about? Who are these people who don't know that China is poorer than the West and has been for a long time? But also, this is just more silly monocausal. The world has like one explanatory variable stuff. So you'll get, for instance, uh, Richard Lin and uh, Tattoo Van Hannon in their 2012 book, Intelligence, a Unifying Construct for the Social Sciences. These are the most famous proponents of the idea that IQ uh, importantly influences the variation in the wealth of nations. They're not the only ones. But they're the most famous ones, and they estimate that IQ can explain about 35% of national variation in wealth, and they posit several other things that explain why it is that some countries don't have the wealth that we would expect based on their IQ. And they point to things like oil reserves, they point to things like socialism in a history of communism, it's just common sense stuff. And, and no one is saying that IQ can explain all the variation in national wealth, but the variation that it can't explain doesn't take away from the variation it can explain. I mean, that's that's insane. So that none of this implies that IQ somehow doesn't influence development nationally. Uh, Taleb also brings up the Flynn effect. He says, oh, this shows that IQ is partly environmental. And again, it's like, well, yeah, there's no one who thinks the heritability of IQ is 100, but it's high. This doesn't tell us anything really about group differences. For simple reasons and for complicated reasons, the simple reason is, like, you have two gardens and they differ in height due to genetic reasons and everyone has poor soil and then you replace the poor soil with rich soil so that everyone's height increases in both gardens but the difference between the gardens is still the same and it's still entirely caused by genes. Basic thought experiment showing Flynn effect is consistent with an entirely heritable group difference. And then in the second place, I mean before, I, I said that the, like the, the well, predictive power of IQ is mostly derivative of this G factor, this principal component. Uh, well, it's like it's not a principal component. Technically, it is a factor. Uh, but this thing underlying the fact that all different mental abilities, uh, cognitive abilities, positively correlate with each other. The Flynn effect has not been on G, right? So that, that's another thing. Whereas group differences are on G. So that the more a given subtest links to general intelligence, the larger the group differences in that subtest are, suggesting that groups fundamentally differ in their general intelligence more than their narrow cognitive abilities. But the Flynn effect 
has been an increase in narrow cognitive abilities more than it has been an increase in general intelligence. And there's a debate about this in the literature, but there's some evidence that in fact general intelligence has declined in the 20th century. So, uh, okay, so Taleb also, he defends the fact that he says things without having any evidence because he says that a psychology only has a replication rate of 50%, so he doesn't need to cite it. Now, even if it's true that you don't have good scientific evidence for something because you don't trust the field, the correct response to that is agnosticism, not a license to just make whatever shit up you want. But setting that aside, uh, like, let's dive into this whole 50% thing. So, like, firstly, this has nothing to do with psychology. Like, yeah, psychology is around 50%. You look at the research economics, is around 60%. Cancer research is about 11%. There was a study that tried to replicate some proportion of 17 brain imaging studies, and it completely failed. Not a single one replicated, suggesting the brain imaging, maybe it has a replication rate of, at most, 5.5%. And, you know, in physical sciences, like uh, chemistry and biology and physics and stuff, uh, it's normally not tested, even, how well this stuff replicates. But if you ask them, so Nature did this. Nature conducted a large survey of scientists and asked them, what proportion of research in your field do you think replicates? I've broken down the results by discipline. We got physics at top, saying 73%. And uh, other saying 52%, but lots of the like no one's at 75%, several are below 60%, right? Biology's at 59%, medicine is at 55%, so engineering's at 55%. So, what is Taleb saying? Like, oh, I mean, this is like he's very vague. This is just a general feature of Taleb's writing. He's, he's a very vague man, but he, but he doesn't tell us the actual replication rate necessary in order to be counted as a science. But he, uh, we know it's not 50%, so if it's 60%, the biology is not a science, nor is engineering. Although some people would say engineering is not a, applied, whatever. Medicine's not a science. If it's 70, then chemistry's not a science, and astronomy's not. So, and heaven forbid it's 80, because then we got to get rid of physics, too. Now, but, but, but anyway, but let's take this as a fact. Like, oh, social science stuff replicates something like 50% of the time, and physical science stuff replicates maybe 60% of the time. Is this like the end of the world? There's a lot of things you could say about this. So, firstly, like, there are a lot of ways to describe the world, and only one way it is. So, you might say... Under a certain way of looking at probability, the probability of a random hypothesis about the world being true is very low, much lesser than one half. But the probability of a hypothesis which has been confirmed by a novel experiment being true is something like one half, meaning that we've made significant epistemic progress, in fact, by the novel experiment. Secondly, we can predict which ones are going to predict, uh, going to replicate very easily, right? So, for one thing, just using a single variable like the p-value. So you look at, uh, in psychology, in that same study that I think Taleb was basing his 50% claim off of, among those studies with an initial p-value of 0.04 to 0.05, the replication rate was 18%, but it was 63% among those with a p-value of less than 0.001. And obviously, the lower you go, the higher the replication rate is. Similarly, in economics, you have a replication rate of 88% for findings with a p-value of less than 0.001 initially. And we know for sure that we can predict this because there have been several studies showing that if you actually just ask people before you predict a bunch of studies which ones do you think you're going to predict and by people i mean you know researchers who know how to read this stuff that the vast majority of the time they can successfully predict that subset of previously confirmed findings which are going to replicate so you know just don't consume research blindly and uh it's not that a, that big of a problem I mean, it's a problem but it's not the end of the world now, now i also want to say that intelligence research is a, an area that we should have less skepticism about than other areas of social science because of its uh, little statistical power uh, if, if you don't understand what statistical power is, then it would probably bore people to explain it, but just know that the higher a field's means level of statistical power is, the more likely it is to replicate, because its false positive rate will be lower. We can see here, compared to many areas of research, intelligence has a much higher level of statistical power, especially, incidentally, research on group differences in intelligence. So, however skeptical we are about social science in general, and I've tried to say that if we consume it intelligent, we, we, we should be skeptical, but not so skeptical that we don't use the research. But however skeptical we are in general, we should be less skeptical of intelligence because it has a higher level of statistical power, which will lead to a greater reliability of research. But of course, I mean, the ultimate solution to this is just to not rely on single unreplicated studies. And yes, we can complain about other things too. We can talk about publication by S&P hacking, and there are ways to lower the risk of those things also. Of course, you can never get the risk of these things down to 0%, but you can get them low enough to where it makes sense to use the research, and I'm not going to go into those specifically because Telab didn't uh, bring them up. But yeah, I mean, intelligently consume single studies and don't just use single studies. Use studies that have replicated, and ideally use meta-analyses and use pre-registered studies and use meta-analyses that check for publication biases with uh, you know the various methods, the funnel plots of the P-curves and all this sort of thing. And so there you go. And so I think that on the whole... On the basis of all this, and, and note that the IQ research I was citing before was meta-analysis after meta-analysis, study after study. It wasn't just a single study that has never been replicated. And so 
I think the research that I cited has epistemic weight, that the things that Taleb said were not very compelling and in large part just assertions that were wildly untrue. And I also thought the article was like bizarrely angry. I don't know why. But uh, in any case, a lot of people seem to think the article had something important to say. And I guess I don't really agree, but maybe I just totally missed it or something. Uh, but in any case, those are my thoughts. So there you go.